join me on that chorus, would you? Well, I'm on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. Out in sin, no more will I abide. I have enlisted in the fight for the cause of truth and right. Praise the Lord, I'm on the winning side. us tonight. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we pray that you'll bless in the service tonight. Thank you for these that are gathered here. Thank you for the family that joined the church this morning, Father. Pray that they'll be a blessing to our church family and we can be a blessing to them. Now be with the service tonight and I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
invite you to take your hymnal 489, 489, the banner of the cross. Let's stand together as we sing this great hymn this evening, verses 1 and 4, page 489.
chorus on the screen, and we'll sing that this evening. The Lord is good. Join me in singing. The Lord is good. Talking back there. So go ahead and be seated there. The usher's going to come and receive the offering tonight. We're going to do it. We're going to give joyfully tonight. Amen. Going to give hilariously tonight. Amen. <laughs> yeah, that's the way the Bible tells us. Give hilariously. And so we'll do that tonight. We're so glad to have you here with us tonight. It's great to have a family join the church this morning. Amen. It's even better when they come back Sunday night. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're glad to have them here with us, and I think they'll fall right in with our uh, rowdy crowd. I think they'll just uh, fall right in here with them. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and uh, Brother Peter, we're glad to see you here tonight. Why don't you stand and lead us in a word of prayer for the offering tonight? Would you do that? to sing a song entitled all that thrills my soul is jesus amen can you say amen to that amen. the world tries to thrill us but it's a short thrill isn't it but the lord's thrill is a long lasting one amen? amen amen and i'm i'm sure that if you've tasted the goodness of the lord you know what i'm speaking about tonight so let's sing it together remain seated before our special music we'll have a ladies duet and the piano in just a moment before they come to sing Let's sing a verse of this as we prepare for the message tonight. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus by his presence all divine? True and tender, pure and precious. Oh, how blessed to call him mine. Oh, the th 
Appreciate that. We're going to have the children. I don't think it's Pastor Pirate now, is it, Pastor Dan? It's Kids Club, it's kids club now, and so we've uh, we're going to Kids Club. All the kids that are going to Kids Club, go ahead and follow Pastor Dan out that way. And uh, and we're, again on Wednesday nights, we're going to have a program for the children as well. On Wednesday nights, it won't be a it won't be a Wano. That won't be till next fall, but we'll start. A children's program. Are we starting that this Wednesday night for the children? This Wednesday night, right? Okay, this Wednesday night we have a, pro a program. or It'll be the following week, actually, because we have graduation. But I'm glad to have my son-in-law, Jeremy Coppock, been pastoring there at Faith Baptist Church in Titusville for 20 years now. Done a great work there. Uh, you know... We, we think about towns and how places can be difficult. That's a town that's not a, it's not a growing town, you know. I mean, when they lost the sh shuttle program over there, things shut down. And uh, some things are picking up. They lost that contract. Did you see the news this last week? They're not even going to give them a chance to get the contract for the new space, uh, uh, what is it, Space Army or whatever, the Space, space Force. Space Force, yeah, the Space Force. They they not even going to give them a chance. I'm not sure what the deal is with that, but nonetheless, uh, he's done well there, and uh, the Lord has blessed them, and uh, I'm glad that he's here. He's going to preach for us tonight. Let's give him a warm welcome. Why don't we give him a warm welcome tonight? Amen? Thank you, Dad. 
So thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate so much the privilege always of being here at Liberty. There's always a lot of freedom here, and I'm just grateful for the privilege to come and to open the word with y'all tonight. I know that you are people who love the word of God, and you're anxious to get into the word of God tonight, and that's what I mean to do with you. Thank you for your prayers always. I know that uh, you're fans of the pastor's daughter. Uh, a <laughs> couple of couple of minutes ago, somebody, it was Sherry, she said, oh, you know, your daughter did, I mean, your wife did so well this morning. And I just said, Sherry, get away from me. Get away from me. I've heard that for 23 years. People say, oh, is this your daughter? And she looks like she's 17. And no, she had a birthday. She's 18. Okay, leave me alone. So we, uh, we do. We appreciate so much, y'all. I know some of you have known us for these years and, and you've prayed for us. And we're really, really grateful. The Lord has truly been good to us over in Titusville. And I tell people often, and I mean this, that we just knew we were going to be a blessing to those people in Titusville. But they have been a blessing to us. And that is the truth of it. We love those people, and we have found our home there. We are grateful for the way that the Lord has used us there. We're humbled by that. And, um, and we, uh, even on a day like today, I can't help but be looking at my watch and wondering where they are and what they're doing and what they're up to. And uh, this is part of the reason we take vacations, though, to detach. And so we are grateful for a little bit of time of rest, and we always appreciate the warm welcome that we enjoy here at Liberty. You know, without God, we can't do anything, right? You know that, right? We can't do anything that's valuable or beneficial. We can't really be a blessing without God. Without God, we can do nothing. The Bible's all over this, talks about this. In fact, I just, I, let me just use, I'm not a theologian, but let me use some high theological terms for a moment, then I'll explain them, don't worry. Honestly, in our natural state, we're stupid. <laughs> that's what we are. We're just stupid. I heard about a little girl who ate some ants. A doctor assured her mother over the phone, no, don't worry, ants aren't harmful. You no need to come in. Then the woman calmly mentioned the ant poison she gave her daughter to kill the ants. The doctor said, get her to the ER. In 2006, true story, in 2006, some Boeing employees stole a life raft from a 747. Shortly after, they took it for a float on a river and then they noticed the Coast Guard helicopter the chopper was homing in on the emergency locator. They, they lost their jobs. And then one more stupid story. A convenience store robber demanded cash and a scotch. The clerk carded him for the scotch. And so he showed him his driver's license and they arrested him two hours later. You want one more? I'll give you one more. Okay, you asked for it. Two robbers entered a shop nervously waving their revolvers. The first one yelled, nobody move. His partner moved, so he shot him. <laughs> so listen, we all know how stupid we really are. And the fact is we would do nothing, we would accomplish nothing if it were not for the presence of God and the character of God that God bestows upon us through our salvation in Jesus Christ. The Lord gives us his Holy Spirit, bestows upon us then the righteousness of Jesus that we might learn to walk in the righteousness of Christ. And ultimately, it's about today, you and I today, walking in the power of God and in the power of his spirit. So, so the Bible kind of uses a phrase to, to speak of this, probably a, a number of different places. But in Psalm chapter 1, this is where I'd love to be with you for a few minutes tonight. So let's go to Psalm 1, Psalm chapter 1. And the Bible calls this the rivers of water. The rivers of water, the character of God that might flow through the life of those of us who would be receptive to the character of God in our lives. The rivers of water from Psalm 1. If you're new to the Bible, this is right in the middle. It's one of the easy ones. Go right to the middle and you'll find the book of Psalms, the biggest book right there in the middle, the book of Psalms chapter 1. And as you go to Psalm chapter 1, we we'll focus tonight on the character of God that would flow into our lives. We call this the rivers of water. In verse one, we're gonna skip one and two for now. We'll double back, don't worry. But in verses one and two, he talks about what we don't do. And then he talks about what we do because we're blessed, what the blessed man does in verse three. This blessed man, the one who loves God's law, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. 
His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's our outline, by the way, verse 3. We're going to spend all of our time here in verse 3 tonight. We'll use some of the balance of the passage for support. But as we look at verse 3, he talks about this being planted like a tree planted by the rivers of water. The rivers of water, speaking of the character of God and speaking of the goodness of God or the presence of God that might flow through our lives and change us, providing, first of all tonight, providing God's character, God himself providing for us. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. We're planted there in the presence of God so that we might enjoy God's strength and God's provision. This is part of the Lord's prayer. The Bible says that we should pray for our daily bread and address this. It's not wrong to ask God for things. He says to do so. Address the needs and go to God for provision. This is what God tells you to do. In verse 3, we understand blessed people are planted like trees by refreshing rivers of water. Blessed people planted like trees by the character of God himself. The running waters provide to the tree the life that it needs. The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, there's a really neat passage there in Ezekiel chapter 17 that talks about Israel. Honestly, it's talking about the people of Israel. And the Bible says that God is like a great eagle and he planted Israel like a tree. Let me read to you for a moment from Ezekiel 17 and verse 3. Thus says the Lord God, a great eagle, that's God, a great eagle with great wings, long-winged, full of feathers, which had various colors, came unto Lebanon. Verse 5. He took also the seed of the land, of the seed of the land, and planted it in a fruitful field. God did this. He placed it by great waters, and he set it as a willow tree. Verse 8. It was planted by a, in a good soil by great waters, that it might bring forth branches, that it might bear fruit, that it might be a handsome vine. That's what God did. That was his intent for Israel, that God might make Israel this goodly vine, this, this, this beautiful thing that would produce, that would be capable. But who provides? God is the one who provides. Do you know that God is the life source for his children? You are very gifted because God made you that way, but you cannot function and you cannot be a blessing without being planted near to the character of God. God, the life source. God is the fountain of life. In Jeremiah 17, he says, O oh Lord, the hope of Israel, the Lord, the fountain of living waters. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1, he says, John writing, he says, he showed me the pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. This river, this flow, this is eternity for us where we will be planted there and the flow of God will flow out into our lives. Boy, it makes sense then why Jesus would have a conversation with the woman at the well and you would be confused about who the well really is because on ultimately Christ is the water, right? I mean, yes, there was that functional uh, stationary material well there, but Jesus is the fountain of water, the water of life. And we are planted like trees. Those who have received Christ, as your savior, you are planted like a tree by the life source, by God himself. Well, it was 23 years ago, almost 23 years ago, Dana, when we were first married and when we were married the first time, I'm teasing, when we were married. And I remember trying to come up with ways, thinking of things, you don't always know what to give somebody. You try to figure out after 23 years, I'd like to think I figured it out, but way back then I got her a, a, a hydrangea, hydrangea, you know, one of these, these flowers. It, it, they're quite beautiful, um, all these little flowers on this thing. And um, so th there's a catch with the hydrangea though. And the catch is hydrangea need water, right? Hydro, that's why they call it, right? Hydrangea, they need water. That thing was dying on the countertop. And I said to Dana one day, I said, so what's up with the hydrangea? She says, I don't know, I don't know. I said, did you water it? And she went, what, oh. So I just want you to know something. This is not for a moment to think that I could have taken care of the hydrangea, all right? I thought maybe she could. I know that I couldn't, but I thought maybe she could. And the fact is this, that plants need water. They need water. 
you might be into this, right? You might be a gardener. You might have a green thumb, okay? We've learned we don't, right? But at the same time, God himself has planted us, and he planted us in a place where we might be refreshed. He planted us near to himself. The Bible in Deuteronomy chapter 11, speaking of Israel, spoke of the early and the latter rains. And what it means is this, the early rain was in Palestine. They came in the autumn, that is October, November. The latter rain came in the spring, around March or April. And so the, 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 the idea behind the latter rain was this. You're, you're blessed with rain in October, but, but if more rain comes in April, then you're really blessed. And what God was saying with this early and latter rains, God was saying basically, look, I mean to bless you. I mean to be so good to you. I mean to be so gentle. I'm determined to love you. I'm determined to refresh you. I'm determined to provide for you. The rivers of water providing. Secondly, purging. So nobody likes that word. We had a little bit of that this morning as we talked about God's chastening from Hebrews. But, but purging, cleaning. See, this is something that's necessary in my life. It's something that's necessary in your life. As a child of God, for, for that matter, any tree that wants to be functional, any tree that's going to do what it's supposed to do, it needs cleaning. Purging sometimes means, right, trimming, right? You get that. Trimming off the, the, the things that shouldn't be there so that the things that should be there can grow uh, uh, and, and be healthy. It's really about health. So there's provision, first of all, but secondly, there's purging. Now look with me at verse 1, all right? The Bible says this, Blesses the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And so you could really quickly, you could dice up these two verses here, and you could look at verse 1, and you could see what he doesn't do. This is, by the way, a message in itself. Blessed uh, bless people don't walk in ungodly counsel. Okay, that's where they don't walk. Secondly, in verse 1, blessed people do not stand in the pathway of sinners. They don't hang out there where sinners are, are, are grouping, where they're hanging out. That's not what blessed people do. Verse 1 again, blessed people do not sit in the seat of the scornful. That, that, it probably has to do with them actually becoming a, a leader among them. They sit in the seat with them, thus a, a, a seat of decision. They don't sit there. That's not for them, they say. It's not for me to be there in the, the, the counsel of the ungodly, the pathway of sinners, the seat of the scornful. Blessed people don't do that. So purging means that I have to make some hard decisions about some of the things that I do, or better yet, some of the things that I refuse to do. Refuse to do, and in fact, when you think of water, there is such thing as good water, but there's also such thing as bad water. We all hear about people who, who get into a, a, a warm pond in the summertime and get an amoeba that crawls into their, their eye or their nose or their ear, and people die. People die that way, because not all water is good water. And you can plant a tree, but the tree needs to be planted by good water. And when you were saved and God gave you his word and gave you the revelation of his character, God wanted to plant you by good water, refreshing water. We talk about these things. I talk about these things with my kids. This is why we make decisions about video games and movies and books and music. This is why we, we make these decisions, because you cannot not be affected by bad water. You got my double negative there, right? You will be affected by bad water. It, you, you cannot keep from being affected by it. You can say all you want. Yeah, well, we don't say that, right? We practice a little bit of that. We watch movies like you do, and we see some things, and we, we say, well, we don't do that, or we don't do that. But you've got to stop for a moment and, and, and understand this. If you, if you took a glass and there was poison in it, and you drank a drink of that glass and set it back down and then turn to your children and say, but we don't do that. You just did. You just did. We don't watch that. You just did. You've already been poisoned. There is such thing as bad water. And Christians, you've got to have some discretion about you. You've got to have, you used the term this morning, some standards. You've got to draw some lines and this, this doesn't have to be about how this person's better than that person or how those people don't measure up to us. It's not about any of that. It's about how you have been planted by good water and God means to be a blessing to you and it would be foolish for you to take in bad water. It would hurt you. This is about your protection, purging, 
purging. Verse 2, blessed people delight in the law of the Lord. On the other hand, they delight in the law of the Lord. Blessed people meditate in God's law each day and each night. So God's word is the refreshing daily bath that I need. Yes, I, I, somebody the other day, his mama asked him, you know, did you shower? He said, yes, ma'am, once a month, whether I need to or not, right? So you probably don't have that going on over here in Sarasota, but I want you to know we got to make them do it, right? You, you, hey, you guys, we took a youth trip a few years ago. Dana made all the teen boys get out of the bus or out of the van. She made them all use deodorant. She went into a dollar store. She bought a, 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 a bar of that stuff, that deodorant. She made them all use deodorant before they could get back in the van, right? Why? We get dirty in this world. We stink. We stink. And we need the word of God for our daily refreshing bath. Listen, listen, listen. Has nothing to do with whether or not you've memorized the Bible itself. You still need the life-giving flow. Has nothing to do with all of your righteousness and all the things you do right. The fact is, you still need a bath. You still need a daily refreshing bath. Doesn't matter how many Sunday school pins you have. Doesn't matter how many years you've been in church. Been there, done that. We know that attitude. Don't you have that attitude? The fact is you still need a daily bath. Purging means cleansing, and it's for your good. John 15, every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. That means he cleans it, that it may bring forth more fruit. And now are you clean, Jesus says, through the word which I have spoken unto you. We are washed by the word of God. You know Ephesians 5, talking about the Christ and the church, the husband and the wife. He gave himself for the church because he loved the church that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing with the washing of water by the word of God. He might present it to himself, a glorious church, presentable. We're not presentable. It's true. We're not presentable until by God's grace we are washed in the word of God. His cleansing is administered by God himself. Do you remember David in Psalm 51? Cleanse me, wash me, he says, thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. God's refreshing word brings healing. We'll talk more about his healing. The book of Revelation talks quite a bit about this, the waters. We need to bathe daily in the cleansing flow of God's character. We need to bathe daily in the cleansing flow of God's character through his word. We get into the word of God. Your daily devotions matter. They matter. People shower. Sometimes they shower at night. Sometimes they shower in the morning. You can read all over the internet about why you should do one and not the other, why you should do the other and not the one. Probably doesn't matter. You just need to shower. Okay? And the fact is, that the morning time, somebody could probably build the case that when you wake up, if you're anything like this guy right here, I don't feel like being a Christian when I wake up in the morning. And I need a bath. I do. I need a bath. I need to get into the Word of God. And so I, if you say, well, I've got only a few minutes each day to get into the Word of God. Well, you can probably, we're, we, it's, we call this adulting. Um, we, we, we make decisions about when we want to do certain things, right? And you could probably, as an adult, you could set aside those minutes in the morning time. If you have them in the evening, well, I don't know why you couldn't have them in the morning time. But, but either way, you need a bath. You need a bath. You've got to get into the word of God and be cleansed by God's word. Isn't this pictured in Noah's flood? Cleansing the earth, water does that. Sometimes it's violent. Sometimes it takes time but it makes a difference. The rushing waters. And tonight you may be sitting here thinking, you know what? I get it. I get it. But I get into the word of God and sometimes I feel so guilty. I feel so frustrated and I feel like God's f a, a flow. The river is tearing me apart. And I would just like to stop you tonight and I want to encourage you. The river is going to help you. The river of God's character is so good. It's God loving on you. It's God helping you. It's God calling you into cleansing, into clean. God calling you into health so that you can be spiritually healthy. Providing, secondly, purging. Thirdly, producing, producing. So this is the goal, right? To produce. In verse 3, go back to the text with me, please. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. We understand the terms here. It's about timing, right? That there's a right time to bring forth fruit. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water and this tree nourished, thus it produces fruit in season. That means at the right time. 
Now listen, there are a lot of times I think that when, when uh, you go up to, um, uh, you might go down to Der Dutchman and you might say, well, I'd like to get a fruit pie. What's in season, right? You understand that. You might go and, and order a smoothie. And, and you know, why is it so expensive to get this one? Because those are not, they're not in season right now. We understand this, that there are different seasons in our lives. There are different times when, when different fruit can be a blessing. God did this. We, we, we have a God of variety who made the world in such a way to where there would be seasons for things, seasons for blessing, seasons of need. And in the same way, you might have the right spirit or the right attitude about, about this or that tonight, but it might not be the right time because you needed it five weeks ago when your family was broken and swimming in tears. And I want to stop you and I want to say, who, who decides this? God decides that you will bring forth the right fruit at the right time if you're having your daily bath. If you're in the word of God, being bathed in the character of God, in the life-giving flow of God's word. We produce as we abide in Jesus. This is John 15, and you pick up what I said earlier. For without me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit, Jesus says. Without Jesus, you can do nothing. Again, no matter how gifted you are, no matter how brilliant you are, it's like a, it's like a computer with amazing components. It's like the best processors and RAM that runs to the side of the room. It's like a computer that'll do anything. But if it's not plugged in or if the battery is dead, what do you got? You got nothing, sister. You got nothing. Because it doesn't have the flow, the power. And I'm saying to you, God's people, you need to stay near to Jesus Christ. It's called being tapped into the vine, right? Being near to him. He's the vine and we are the branches. In Revelation 22, I mentioned this to you a moment ago, but let me read again. He showed me the pure river of water of life. And in the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, there was the tree of life. And its leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. I'm, I'm fascinated by that verse. Again, I don't have the green thumb. But I'm fascinated that the leaves were for the healing of the nations. And it, and it strikes me that for all the suffering, as you're talking about this on Sunday mornings right now, for all the suffering in the world, it strikes me that there is a God in heaven who cares. Of all the places in the Bible that Jesus would have wept, he wept at a funeral when people were weeping themselves. He wept because people hurt. There's a God in heaven who wants there to be healing in the world. He wants people to have healing, and it has to do with the leaves and the fruit that is produced in the Christian. Listen, please, carefully. The fruit that is produced in the Christian is the healing that this world needs. Do you know there's brokenness in Sarasota? There are tears tonight. There are people that are weeping. And you, Christian, you, God brought you to bring healing into the lives of these people. Because of God's character flowing into and through and out of you. Into the community around you. God has brought you into this place to be an instrument of healing. That the fruit of God in your life, his spirit, his character, would begin to evidence itself in you. And you would be a blessing. God made you for this. To be a blessing in your neighborhood, in this church, in the community around you. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, you may not be a tree hugger as I am not. At the same time, it's interesting that God has a conversation about saving trees. He does. He says, when you go in to conquer a city, he says, as you do this, he said, you can cut down the trees that are not fruit bearing trees because you're going to conquer the city, cut down the ones that aren't fruit-bearing trees. Use those for your battle, battering rams. Use those for your embattlement. Use those to, to, to mount your war against that city. But after you conquer the city, you're going to need the fruit trees. God says don't touch those because it makes more sense that you'll need them in the long run. You mean to conquer the city, right? Then we're going to need the fruit trees. The fruit matters. The fruit is a blessing. The fruit indicates what's underneath. You know this, Christian. Jesus said, you know them by their fruits. And so if we know them by their fruits, I would stop you tonight and I would just ask you a question. If, if you are indeed a tree, as, as the scripture has laid out this scenario for us, if you're a tree and you bear fruit, is your fruit bitter? 
Do the people in your office, when they come and they pluck from your branches, are they getting bitterness? Are they getting um, uh, unkindness? You say, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm a perpetual grump. Well, guess what? Perpetual grumps don't win people to Christ. They don't. They might scare them into the kingdom, but they don't win people to Christ. And I'm telling you, Christian, that you did not learn that from Jesus. Jesus was not a grump. He was not, he was not cranky. He didn't have a bad attitude. We could quickly build the case here tonight that Jesus was, was dealt the worst deal in that he gives his righteousness and gets my sin. All right? So we could quickly build that case. I don't see any of that grumpiness as he hung there on the cross. Instead, I hear him saying, Father, forgive them, right? This is what I hear from the Son of God. And I'm saying to you, I, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just being real with you, all right? We're here together tonight so we can be real, okay? You're not a blessing when you're grumpy. And God made you to be a blessing. He made, that's why he planted you by the rivers of water. He planted you near to his character. Oh, we're so spoiled that we all have copies of the word of God. We've got it on our phones. We've got multiple copies in our cars. We've got one under the seat of the car that we've long forgotten about. One in the trunk. We lost one. Doesn't matter. I've got another one. We, th this is how we are. But my question for you, Christian, are you there in the word of God, the life-giving flow of God, flowing into, upon, over, through, and then out of your life? into the world around you. Go back to the word of God. Get back into your devotions. Make the decision now while you're thinking with your spiritual brain, while you're focused on spiritual things. Make the decision right now about what you're not gonna watch after church tonight, about what you are gonna do in the morning before you begin your day and your week. Make the decision now before you go forward because this church needs the fruit of your mercy and this world needs the fruit of your kindness. This world needs you to be a Christian, a Christian, a Christ follower, the rivers of water, providing, purging, producing, and lastly, prospering, prospering. So go back with me, please, to verse 3. The Bible says this, and he shall be like a tree. This is the blessed man that decided to delight in the law of the Lord. Verse 2, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. These are pretty tall statements here that God gives in his word. His leaf shall not wither, and what he does shall prosper. Now, listen. As we talk about our work, as we talk about our profession, as we talk about the things that we do with our time, we talk about um, uh, fixing something in the backyard or fixing something in the kitchen. These are all things that we do, and we could, we, we, we could use some prosperity, right? We could use some success. Nobody likes to go and to work on something all day long and to find out it's still broken at the end of the day. It's, oh, great, wonderful, it's broken, right? Let's go sit down and drink lemonade. We've earned it. I, we don't do that, right? We want success. We want prosperity. That's what we're looking for. And very quickly, how can I get such prosperity? What do my actions look like? If I'm a tree planted by the rivers of water, what do my actions look like? I'm going to give you one, two, three, four. It's going to sound like the takeaways perhaps in another sermon you've heard, but think about it in, in respect to the tree. Number one, meditate in the word of God. We said that in verse two, didn't we? Meditate in the word of God. You could go into the book of Joshua. Many of you could quote the verses to me. This book of the law shall not depart out of, out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Well, what happens when you meditate in the word of God and do according to all that is written therein? He says, that's when you make your way prosperous and that's when you have good success. This is about putting time into the word of God and meditating in what God says. Stop for just a moment. You might be one of those list people, all right? I'm a, I'm a box checker. All right, I'm a box checker. My favorite thing to do is to take a post sticker and to throw it away. It's my favorite thing to do, okay? Because somebody hands me something, they say, this needs to be done. They hand me that, and that thing sits on my desk, and it torments me, all right, until it's done. And when it's done, I wad that dude up, and I practice my shot, right? I'm so happy to get that thing done. It's a real problem if you handle your devotions that way, though. If you sit down and read your Bible, and you check it off, all right, and you quickly flip on the TV, you quickly go into the room and do who knows what else. Stop for a moment. Christian, I'm telling you, we're not meditating on the word of God. 
I don't mean you don't think about what you read through the day. Look, no judgment here. I've got the same crazy schedule that you do, same amount of time in the week. And the fact is we have to discipline ourselves in this crazy world to stop and to meditate on what God has said. Read the Bible, but think about the Bible. Think about what God has said. Stop. Listen. That's what I think. I'm convinced that that's why God made coffee. In my house, we call it holy water. All right? This is, this is what it is. Because, see, the mug's got to be big enough to make you stay there longer than what you were reading. You stay a little bit longer. You get to sit there, and you get to finish that mug. And as you finish that mug, and you think about what you've read. Dear God, would you allow what you have put in front of me tonight or this morning to soak into my heart and change me? Because I want to be a blessing. I want to be a blessing. And, and I get it. That if, if, if I don't allow your word to flow through my life and into the lives of, of others, I, I'm not a blessing. I want to be a blessing. And so, God, would you allow this to soak into my heart and teach me this lesson that I read in this passage here tonight or in this passage over here about uh, uh, this Bible character or these principles out of Proverbs or what Jesus did in Matthew 4. Whatever it is that you're reading, the word of God is oozing with signals as to the character of God and what he's about. As you get into the word of God, think about it, stop, focus, devote yourself to the Lord. That's why we call them devotions. We don't call them readings. We call them devotions. It's you sitting down, reading, learning, and growing in the word of God. Secondly, I mentioned this earlier, stay tapped into the vine. You've got to stay close to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who gets you into heaven, and Jesus Christ is the one who gets you anywhere that matters. You've got to stay close to Jesus Christ. John 15, 7, Jesus said, if you abide in me, that means to remain close to. You remain close to me. You, you abide in me, and my words abide in you. That's what we're talking about here. Then you ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. You'll be so close to Jesus that you'll have a functional prayer life and a functional relationship with God. All right. Listen, when you were saved, you got into God's family. You got a seat at God's table and you got saved. No question. But if you want a functional, prosperous relationship, you're going to have to stay close to this God who saved you. You're going to have to stay close to him. Stay tapped into the vine. Number three, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Listen, we're in a, a weird world today. I don't know how else to describe it. It's just weirdness. All right. Of people. Uh, uh, doing their own thing these days, it seems like. And people that I thought were uh, 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 on the team uh, uh, seem to not be on the team sometimes, right? And it's frustrating for us to see these things. Well, listen, we can spend our days lamenting their drama, or we can stop and just verify that we ourselves are not losing our way. Show some respect to God. And whatever you do, show some respect to God. As you make decisions, don't make them so hastily, Christian. We have the, the, the stamina of a spark. I mean, we are, we, are, we are so spontaneous, it seems like, these days. We have to slow down and allow God to lead us. Allow him to lead you in the decision to buy a car, to buy a house, to take a job, to marry someone. You slow down and you listen to God and allow God to help you. Show some fear for God. Psalm 128, verse 1. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord and walks in his ways. Listen to what he says. For thou shalt eat of the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be. It shall be well with thee. And thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Isn't that interesting? God says your family just like planted trees that God plants there alongside of you. Because you have shown respect to the God of the Bible. Meditate in the word. Stay tapped into the vine. Fear the Lord. And lastly, do right. Do right. I declare there are many times when we say, oh, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I just, I'm looking through the word of God. I've been praying about it and all these things. You know what? I think we know more than we let on sometimes. Sometimes I think God's just not telling us what we want to hear. And so we say, I don't really know what God wants me to do. Oh, no, no. You know. You just don't want to do it. You know what God said already. Christian, we act like God's playing hide the ball from us or that God is, 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 is uh, uh, avoiding us in the hall. Like, like, you know, you pass the hall and, and somebody looks down and they don't look at you, you know? We, 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 we act like God's treating us that way. I don't know. He's not, God's not very friendly these days, right? No, 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 no. God's not hiding the ball from you. God wants you to know what he's got to say. God wants you to know what to do. And so he gives you his word and he plants you by the rivers of water. 
near to his character so that you might enjoy his strength in your life. Real prosperity comes as God's refreshing words flow through our hearts and into the lives of others. God can use you, will use you to be a blessing, but you're going to have to do right. When he makes it clear to you, you're going to have to do right. I love the story of Joseph. I think everybody knows what happened with Joseph, or you've got a clue. You could pick up the last fourth of the book of Genesis and mostly get his story. Genesis 39 um, uh, picks up when he was sold as a slave into Egypt. And it's an, there's an ugly scene there, what happened in the lives of, uh, life of Joseph. But you know what? The Bible says God was with Joseph, and he was prosperous. So God was with him. And then when Joseph was with a man by the name of Potiphar, that man was prosperous. And then when Joseph was in the prison, then they were prosperous and things went well in the prison. They put anything they put into Joseph's hands. Well, then they took Joseph and they made him number two in all of the land. And guess what happened in Egypt during a time of terrible famine when the rest of the world was floundering and spinning out of control? Things went well for Egypt. Why? Because of Joseph. What, what happened? What, well, what happened? Joseph, God's man for God's time, there planted the character of God flowing through his life. And as a result, the lives of everybody around him, their lives were changed. See, prosperity is not a, a large bank account. It's just not. It's not a big house. It's not the freedom to make decisions without thinking about money. Prosperity is not power. Prosperity is not self-glory. Prosperity is not your possessions. Prosperity has more to do with God's character flowing through you into the world around you. God's character flowing through Christ, flowing into you and into your life and then out of your life into the lives of the world around you. What's that called? That's called being a blessing. Being a blessing. What happened? Well, you just got your daily bath. That's all. Got into the family of God, the Holy Spirit living inside, and you got your daily bath. The rivers of water. The rivers of water. Think about that. Next time you wonder about your daily devotions, when you stop for just a moment here, please with me tonight, will you please address your daily devotions? Would you stop and realize it's not about all the right things you do? It's not. That's called self-righteousness. No, it's about the power of God flowing into your life and through you into the world around you so that you can be a blessing, providing, God providing, purging, leading to our producing and ultimately prospering. Without God, we can do nothing. I bumped into a passage in the book of Job. I, I, I was appreciated you mentioning Job this morning. And I, I tell you what, Dad, I, I love so much. If there's anybody that could lecture the rest of us about hope, it would be Job. Listen, we would be sticking our heads in the sand to act like life's not complex. And you say, well, yeah, it's really easy to say, read your Bible and go to church. It's really easy. You're right. You're right. It's very easy for those words to come out of my mouth. But life is complex. If there's anybody who understood how hard it could be, that would be Job. I'm convinced this is why God revealed his story. Job is not the only one that suffered. At the same time, God gives us a, a, a front row view of his life to understand some things that happened. And listen to what Job says in chapter 14 and verse 7. Listen to this. Think about the tree. Think about your life and think about hope. For there is hope, the Bible says. There is hope of a tree. If it be cut down, that it will sprout again and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth and the stock thereof die in the ground. Listen to verse nine. Yet through the scent of water, it will bud and bring forth bows like a plant. Boy, that passage gives me hope. It makes me think, you know what, I've, I've, I'm, I'm like those stupid people I started with tonight. You do a lot of dumb things. I think, my word, I feel like sometimes I've got a monopoly on stupid, and then I look at some of us, right? And the fact is, we all do really stupid things, even as believers, even as followers of Christ. We get off the path. And I want to stop you tonight, and I want to encourage you for just a moment. There is hope. There really is hope that, 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 that even a tree that is cut down through the scent of water might bud again and grow and sprout branches 
and bring forth fruit and be the blessing that God meant for you to be from the very beginning. The Bible says in Ezekiel 47, the tree was planted there, many trees on both sides of the flowing river. Everything would live where the rivers would flow. This unpassable river in Ezekiel 47, and it says, and they shall be healed. Everything shall live where the river comes. Ezekiel 47, 12, the fruit would be eaten and ever blooming, and there would be new fruit every month. The leaves would be for medicine, the Bible says, and the waters of the river would flow out of the sanctuary. And I think God speaks of these things because he, he wants us to understand there's hope for people that are broken. There's hope for trees that are struggling. There's hope for people who feel cut down and underappreciated. There's hope for people who have lost their way. And even for God's people who have floundered around or been distracted or, or, or uh, uh, become the winners of, of the local Grumpy Award, even some of God's people need to just stop and realize, you know what? There's hope for me. There's hope for me through the scent of water that God's flow in my life again might cleanse me like a rag, a dirty rag. God might clean me up and make me a blessing so that I might be clean again and useful for him. There was a garment all ruined with stain, darkened with filth and oil and blood and pain, but taken and dipped in the river's flow. The fabric was cleaned and its whiteness did show. I am that cloth once damaged in mud, now bought by the Lord and washed in his blood. Daily I'm cleansed in the life-giving flow of himself through his word, that I may know the joy of clean, the removal of stains, walking with Jesus in fruit that remains. Would you bow your heads with me, please? I think you know what to do with this invitation here tonight. My question for you is just one, just one question for you tonight. How's it going with your daily devotions? How's it going planted there by the rivers of water? Are you growing? Are you being changed by the word of God? Are you meditating in the word of God? Are you stopping to pray and to listen to the voice of God? Are you more concerned with how you look before and after church than how you are on the inside? Are you more concerned with the drama of Monday than hearing the voice of God on Monday morning? How are your devotions going? If we could be clear in this invitation tonight, I'm inviting you to come and to pray. Come and pray and meet with the Lord here tonight. And if you've got something to work out with God, then work it out now. Just come, just come immediately before you hear music, before you hear anything else. Come and meet with the Lord here and pray. Pray to him and say, dear Lord, I'm wrong. I'm wrong about us and I'm wrong about the, 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 your power in my life. I thought I could do it without these daily devotions. I thought somehow, Lord, at least that's what my actions have said. But dear God, tonight I repent and I ask you, please find me again on my knees in front of you. Receptive to hear, to grow, to be changed by your word. Would you stand with me please tonight? Would you stand with me with our heads bowed and our eyes closed? Father, would you change our hearts tonight please and teach us how completely de dependent we are upon you and upon your word, upon the flow of your character in and through and then out of our lives and into the lives of others. Will you please teach us, Lord, that we might be devoted to you again. Give us courage and strength to make hard decisions about what we do, what we don't do so that, Lord, we might draw near to you and abide in the vine and in your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Preacher.